Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Crash and today we're talking about Shoujo. There's a lot of misinformation regarding the Shoujo demographic, including things I've talked about in my manga demographics video, but perhaps one of the biggest even among Shoujo fans is that the demographic emerged in the 70s. The reason for that is that in the 70s a revolution in Shoujo happened that changed the genre forever. Revolution so big that the past of Shoujo was ignored by fans and critics of this new wave. In this two-part series of Manga 101, we'll be looking at this era of Shoujo. In part two, we'll be talking about the revolution and the people responsible for it, but today we'll be remembering what was forgotten and acknowledge what was ignored, the lost era of Shoujo. While there are many people that realize that Shoujo didn't appear in the 70s, there is one manga that is often cited as the starting point of Shoujo as a whole. A manga that is for Shoujo what Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy was for Shonen. Crucially enough, the mangaka responsible for this manga is very much Osamu Tezuka himself. With 1953's Princess Knight, with Tezuka going as far as claiming that he invented Shoujo. But on the contrary, Shoujo manga was very much a thing for decades before Tezuka dabbed on the stuff. In our manga magazine video, we mentioned Shoujo Sekai, one of the first Shoujo manga magazines in 1906, almost 50 years before Princess Knight. Shoujo Sekai and other pre-war manga magazines didn't really focus completely in manga, mixing it with articles and narrative stories. Pre-war Shoujo had its peak in the 1920s and 1930s, when more girls started to have access to secondary education. With schools being the same gender at the time, the girls would develop their own teen culture separated from the boys. Shoujo magazines would target and influence this culture, with Shoujo Club and Shoujo no Tomo being the most important ones at the time. Due to the nature of all-girls schools, early Shoujo did didn't focus much in male to female romance at all, and instead on the relationships between the girls. This ended up forming a genre known as Class S. Class S was very much manga whose focus was in this relationship between girls. It was essentially love relationships, yet this used to be perfectly acceptable for young ladies as long as they kept it only within their teenage years. This relationship was often seen as something spiritual. The meaning of S in Class S is debated. Some say it's for Jojo, some say it's for Sister. Classes manga will be banned from 1936 until the end of World War II, and although all girls schools are closing in favor of co-ed schools, the genre will eventually turn to be a staple of Jojo. It's hard to define this era, however. The 20s and 30s Jojo magazines were very present and influential in the lives of middle and upper class girls, and the same could be said about the 70s and afterwards, with Jojo as we know it starting around this time but there's this in-between that ends up being largely forgotten. Perhaps this is because of a shift in the target demographic, while Shoujo from before and after this phase mostly targeted teen girls as Shonen did for boys, the 1950s saw a shift into the market targeting elementary school girls. The few magazines who tried to keep up with the style of the pre-war times would find themselves failing to gather any decent following, eventually ending publication. The common teenage girl in the early post-war Japan will be more keen to watch movies directed towards the demographic as opposed to manga. This obviously led to a surge of movies for teens and decrease in manga for them as well. It's in this post-war environment that Suzuka would thrive, among all demographics really, and that Princess Knight would surge. It should be noted that in this era, shoujo manga was written mostly by male authors. It was generally seen as an entryway to manga, with authors doing shoujo before moving to shonen or gekika manga later on. Despite the frequent bolts claiming that Princess Knight invented Chojo, Princess Knight gave very little to the movement going forward. Yes, the manga was the first serialized story in Chojo, similar to Astro Boy with Shonen, but the aesthetic style and themes aren't necessarily what would become the staples of the movements to come. To be fair, most of this 50s Chojo manga didn't really have a set style at all, it, that would come later on. If we want to see the development of Chojo as we know it today, we need to look elsewhere. Takashi Makoto and Nakahara Junishi, to be more precise. Nakahara Junishi was an illustrator and fashion designer whose work in Chojo Notomo between 1935 and 1940 was quite important. To be specific, he was in charge of the covers, so most girls reading the magazine would see these art first and foremost. Nakahara introduced a style based on dolls, and is largely credited to be the man who created the Chojo eyes style. Takahashi Makoto would take inspiration from Nakahara's art in his own style, and he would create the roots of modern shoujo. Makoto's first shoujo manga came in 1956, Paris Tokyo manga about writing shoujo manga actually. This manga also focused a lot on parenting and relationship between the mother and the child, which is a frequent staple of this era. Makoto's style was a mix of picture book and manga. His Sakura Namiki, from 1957, the only scanlated and translated manga I've found of his, starts with large illustrations with narration on top. It barely feels like a manga, at least not until the later pages, and even then, the panels are considerably big and artistic. The girls look familiar in style, slender and doll-like, with huge, beautiful eyes, floral and emotional backgrounds lurk behind them. 1958's Arashi Okere, or Behind the Storm, is often considered his most important work. It introduced and popularized the three-row overlaid style picture, meaning a picture of a character on the side of a three-row panel. Arashi Okere did this at least once a chapter, and readers were encouraged to draw their own versions and send them in. 
for a chance to win prizes. The style picture could also be cut and pasted whenever the reader pleased. It didn't take long for the technique to be replicated. Narashi Okere started solicitation in January and by March we found a earliest example of his influence, Scarlet Camellia, published in Shoujo book by Narumi Hakira. By early as 1959 the style had spread all over the shoujo scene, completely reshaping the paneling of the demographic to more dynamic presentation, especially compared to the shonen brethren. One last thing that Makoto would slowly have to style that would spread was stars in the eyes of the characters. This wasn't present in his early works, but starting in 1959 he would have them in certain drawings. The amount of stars would gradually grow, by the 70s it was a trademark of his illustrations. If shoujo by this point had been a largely male-written field, with stories focusing more on what the men perceived the morals of the female should hold, and put them into paper, it was in the 60s that the shift started happening, with a whole new generation of women stepping up. Yoshiko Nishitani was one of these new mangaka, and she's notable for introducing shoujo to the genre that people would more often attribute to shoujo, the school rom-com. Her manga, Mary Lou, debuted in 1965 and it was landmark in the industry. One of the first manga focused largely on romance, and one of them taking place with a normal high school girl in a normal high school school. In 1968, one of the most important 60s manga will be released, Attack No. 1, by Chicago Urano. Tech number one was a volleyball manga inspired by a recent victory from the Japanese female volleyball team in the 1966 Olympics. Its impact is more visible in the anime adaptation. While it wasn't the first shoujo to be adapted that Accolade would be given to Sally the Witch in 1966, an adaptation of the manga of the same name, but Attack No. 1's anime, released in 1969, would increase the female audience by 20% and prove that the shoujo market could be a lucrative one. It also influenced a change in how sports manga were presented in shoujo. Before Attack No. 1, most sports shoujo were sports that were considered girly like, like ballet and horseback riding, but Attack No. 1 influenced other mangaka to try to pursue other sports in shoujo, like Ace Owen would do with tennis in 1973. The 70s came with a brand new generation of mangaka would push shoujo to its limits. These new artists would be commonly known as the Year 24 or the Magnificent 49ers. Many people opt to recognize them as the true starting point of shoujo, which led to most manga published in the times we just talked about to be often neglected. But the Year 24 and the critics of shoujo past this era aren't necessarily the only thing to blame for the lack of information of the, on the shoujo manga of the past. Tenkamons would only be a regular thing in the 60s, and he started with shonen titles, which made most manga before the series to be exclusively published in their original magazines, which, as I've talked about in the previous video, weren't made to last many years. So information got lost. Even the ones that got released in Tenkamon form wouldn't necessarily publish in large scale, and copies might be lost or in very few numbers unless they ended up being reprinted later on. It's easy for people born in this internet age to believe that history gets recorded forever, that nothing gets lost. This has always been the case, which is why it's good to stop and look back sometimes. To what was done before. I hope this video helped you learn something new about Jojo, because researching it certainly helped me. Talking about help, I do want to give a shout out to some friends of mine who helped me find articles about this topic. A shout out to them and a list of article names and links will be in the description below. Definitely recommend reading them if you want more details on the topics I just talked about today. In a couple weeks, our journey through Shoujo's history continues, so if you want to be informed of when that comes out, don't forget to subscribe. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're curious about my history, there's more videos about it in my channel. And if you watch it till here, thank you very much, and I'll see you next video.